The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability explicit or implied shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. What's working on purpose anyway? Each week, we ponder the answer to this question. People ache for meaning and purpose at work, to contribute their talents passionately, and know their lives really matter. They crave being part of an organization that inspires them and helps them grow into realizing their highest potential. Business can be such a force for good in the world, elevating humanity. In our program, we provide guidance and inspiration to help usher in this world we all want, working on purpose. Now, here's your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. Hello, welcome back to the Working on Purpose program. Thanks for tuning in again this week. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez, joining you live from Dallas, Texas, which is home base for me. By way of introduction, I'm a management consultant specializing in meaning and purpose, organizational logotherapist, inspirational speaker, social scientist, and author. There are many ways we can work together. Check us out at elisecortez.com or gusto-now.com. I've also got some free resources for you to download on both of those sites. If you've been tuning in for a while, you know this program is a thought leadership platform that enlightens and inspires listeners and viewers with insights from distinguished business leaders, authors, and subject matter experts. By listening in, you're part of the movement to create inspirational leaders and enlivening workplaces where we can thrive and do business that betters the world. Glad you're here. With us today is Michael Levy. He is the CEO of WorkProud, and he has helped over 450 companies greatly improve their engagement scores and reduce turnover through the design and development of award-winning employee reward and recognition programs. We'll be talking about the importance of employee recognition, how it can be done effectively, and its ROI. Michael, welcome to Working on Purpose. There he is. Hello, Michael. Hello. How's one of my favorite Aussies? I'm fantastic today. All the better for you asking. All Great right. Here in the beginning of 21. Thanks for having me on your show. You are the first program of 2021. You have the distinguished um, uh, ability to be able to say you're the, you're the first of 2021. So, and you are episode number 310. So, I let's just call it special. I'm feeling special because this is the year where you peel off the mask. Oh, I like it, Michael. I like it. I like it. You can go. Whoo! Right. Nice. Even even though the latter versions are becoming progressively more fashionable. Yeah, and sexy. Let's just say it. Correct. My um, wife showed up with this black number. It had gold chains. I'm like, okay, we're still. There. <laughs> <But> <laughs> that's the know. way to do it. That's the way to do it. Well, I can't quite do you do do you justice by introducing you. I gave you I gave our listeners and viewers a little bit about you, but uh, would you say just a little bit about who you are, where you came from? Obviously, you came from Australia by way of by way of Australia, I should say, but who is this crazy Michael Levy guy? Oh, uh, a growing and evolving work in process, part Frankenstein, part human being, part father. So uh, born in Sydney, Australia, and stayed there until I was given an opportunity to uh, spread my wings and come to the great United States. And I didn't really have a particular agenda, vision, or otherwise. I'm what was supposed to happen, only like many immigrants, we come here to this wonderful country and then get engaged by all of the fantastic opportunities, uh, personally, professionally, emotionally, that this country has. You know, that's why America is such an amazing uh, place to be. Not that Australia is a bad place. But anyway, so I came here 21 years ago, um, married uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, also from Australia, had three lovely children. That's the personal side. Um, ended up in Dallas randomly. Um, I'd, I'd almost say proud to be Texan now, but what a great place Texas is. And uh, ended up uh, getting involved in in, uh, in building reward programs, if you want me to give a little uh, sort of introduction and segue into that. Um, building some reward programs with some fine gentlemen I met from Cincinnati, Ohio, Mark Slegel and John Nodal. And uh, we met some 21, 22 years ago, and I said, you know, can you build rewards programs? Because my wife thinks reward programs are fantastic. The airlines have them, and that's how we get back to Australia. 
And uh, they said, sure, we can build rewards programs for you. And that began a, a journey, which we'll you know, get into during the course of the show, but a journey that said, well, it's not all about the rewards. Actually, a lot of it is about that recognition and, 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 uh, and feedback. So, so there's a bit, about, a bit of background on me, a bit of background introduction on, on how I come to be on, on your show. Splendid, and I think you remember that I have been to your lovely city, to Sydney, in 2018. I did climb the bridge against my better judgment and tried to get over my fear of heights, and it did help just a smidge. So thank you for that, Michael. <laughs> okay, so let's get into the, the actual content. You know better than most of us do, and if I were to ask anybody on the street this question, I'd give a different answer. But why, from your perspective, is employee appreciation so important? So it was not something that I inherently knew, and that goes to you know, the pick up from the, the journey of this business that built points programs, you know, to the present day and its manifestation in a service called Workproud. And that was uh, the original programs were being we were being asked to to build were similar to the airline points programs, give out points for doing different behaviors. Uh, let people then accumulate these points and redeem them for different things. Uh, so we were being asked to build programs in a market research capacity, so participate in surveys and reward points. We were asked to build programs associated with wellness activities, do your wellness thing, get your checkup, get an in-home assessment, get your flu shots, uh, and redeem those points for things. And then a lot of employers were getting us to do programs for their employee population. One client program, uh, you know, in particular, was a big uh, retailer plus 100,000 employees in the U.S. And they had sort of, let's just say, had some budget constraints at some point in their history, and they pulled the points-based monetary aspects out of the program. And I had this great fear that the program's value to the employee population would be proportionately diminished by the amount of money that they pulled out of it, which is they pulled most of the money out. But what I was surprised to see was that actually the recognition activity in the program sustained. Granted, there was some dimensional change in the totality of activity, but not proportionate to the money that the company and client was investing. I said to myself, that's interesting. So people were participating in this program for more than just the monetary aspect. Why were they participating? And so began a journey that began some decade ago with this particular client towards an orientation that says, actually, that recognition and feedback is a powerful driver. It doesn't replace money. People can't feed their families, pay their bills, fuel up their cards or go on trips. Uh, with recognition, uh, but conversely, the question of uh, are people satisfied with their job uh, if they get paid 10 cents more per hour or at the end of each year, depending upon what kind of you know, job you have, a corresponding bonus or otherwise, and you know the data supports conversely that view that money doesn't drive the satisfaction. Money is a portion of the professional work experience. We work to achieve some things. But that recognition pulls at a different type of heart stream. And so, you know, thus we got into the business of saying, well, how do you make recognition valuable, meaningful, uh, frequent enough that it is present, not too frequent, that its value is diminished by the frequency of it? You know, and so uh, we started to uncover this wonderful world of uh, systematizing employee appreciation, recognition and feedback and their corresponding overlaps because what really is the difference between a feedback and a review and a recognition and appreciation beyond the consistency, frequency and format that it takes place. They're all driving at a similar experiential uh, uh, objective, which is to make a person feel acknowledged um, for the things that they're doing within a commercial corporate setting that gives them personal satisfaction. So that's how we're seeing it. And you know, the, the, uh, the, the impacts that we're having on companies are substantial, especially within the context of an ROI service. 
Okay, <clears throat> two things, Michael. First, I have got to acknowledge you for just what I hear, the way that you roll in the world. It just sounds like to me that you have this ability, this tremendous ability just to put one foot after the other in your whole entire life. And wherever that foot lands, you figure out how to make the world around you work. And I think that is exceptional. That is that is something to celebrate. I didn't know that about you before, but I, I think that's fantastic. What I would call that is presence. I would call that the ability to be present. And I, I just want to celebrate that. So that's that's number one. Um, you're, you're all right with that? I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're, you're sort of blushing a little bit. Don't um, make the trouble any bigger. Okay, okay. Don't, I, your <laughs> wife is not going to like that if I do that. But um, then, now the second thing, too, that I want to get to is just how wonderful you discovered this idea, right? So as you know, because we've done some work together this last year, that my jam is meaning and purpose. And so the, you're, you have found your way into a way of elevating meaning in the workplace and thereby increasing fulfillment. And I just really, of course, you know, that's why you and I, or we, we we work together. That's I think we could probably finish our sentences each other of the other. But I, I just want to recognize that the way you did that was so organic and natural and beautiful. And I would say that it, it, it seems like it, it unfolded in a way that was of service to um, the client, but also it really gave you something new and, and a new way of looking at the world and employment and connection and meaning. And, and here you are, the guru now. I don't know about that. You know, I mean, a few things. Necessity is the mother of all great inventions, which is something my father used to say. And so clearly the need for what we're doing and the services we're providing has been there. It's somewhat, if you consider a natural extension of the development and evolution of HR practices over time. And if we look back, HR practices have continued to grow and evolve to meet their customers. Who are their customers? Employees. And employees have continued to evolve and grow their own individual capabilities, their strengths, their ability to contribute, as well as the sophistication of the companies themselves. Payroll used to be a big thing. Now payroll is managed. Right. Uh, HRIS systems that organized a centralized database for your employee populations. So you knew who worked for you and who they reported to and how many days off. Some time ago, that was sort of being managed by Excel spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. Now we take that all for granted. So as that trend and evolution of the HR practices continue to evolve, it allows HR and organizations to uh, consider what they're trying to do and what their objectives are within a business. Their business objectives are to enhance and elevate and evolve the practices that produce the outputs of what is arguably for many companies the most expensive cost component mm -hmm. not factories not big plants not capital equipment but human beings so you ask yourself well you know if you were at a manufacturing plant and you had this machine you're very interested in how do you make the machine operate its best. You position it in the right way. You have its service consistency. You make sure it's oiled. You make sure that whatever adapters and accessories come onto that work so that the machine works the best. And what happens before the machine and after the machine in the process. And now you've got optimization. So now let's talk about that in a human being context. We're not like machines. Right? So we don't have quite as easy inputs and outputs. But what we do have in common and here i'm going to quote you know one of my favorites which is you know oprah winfrey speaking to the uh graduating class of uh of harvard or forgive me if it was yale i hope it was the correct college but she does this so beautifully in her wonderful stylistic and natural humanistic approach which she says I've interviewed the Bushes, I've interviewed Obama, I've interviewed firefighters, I've interviewed Beyonce, I've interviewed housewives, and every time the interview is completed, as I may do, you know, with you elites after this, she puts the microphone down and they go, hey, <laughs> Oprah, I wonder if they say that, hey, Miss Winfrey, you know, how did I go? Was, was I okay? Right? Well, why would the Bushes right, or Obama or Beyonce, for that matter, or all of the housewives or otherwise ask that question, but they're looking for that affirmation. Mm -hmm. Just tell me I did good. Right. Tell me 
things that I'm doing are meaningful and contributing. So it is all within that context and construct, the evolution and growth of you know, HR as a business practice, to the acknowledgement that the human capital of m not all, but a large proportion of US businesses are driven by human beings, customer service, entertainment, hospitality, maybe even innovation, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing, et cetera, still a huge human component to it. Well, human beings, obviously, per Oprah's comment, like that validation and appreciation. Why do they like it? What does it mean that they like it? Well, if they like it, they want it. And so they're gravitating naturally towards things that will give them that satisfaction. Mm -hmm. right? And so for that reason, I didn't really invent any of this. Naturally, as we go deeper and have been going over the last 10, 20 years, into this world while interestingly observing Facebook and Instagram and wait till you see what happens with a generation of kids who grew up with the TikTok you know, every day. <laughs> no, yes. Doing the thing. Well, you know, I mean, what's going to happen when they get to the next stage? So we're like, great, well, maybe we got to systematize these ways in which recognition and appreciation and feedback are happening so they speak to the audience, the customers, the human beings, the employees of most of corporate America, which is, well, bring it to them because if you build it, they will come. If you build great companies and cultures that people want to work and give their best, well, then they're most likely to want to give their best, all other things being equal. Of course, beautifully rendered and beautifully said, and a perfect way to send us into our first break, Michael. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. We've been here with Michael Levy. He is the CEO of WorkProud, and he's helped over 450 companies greatly improve their engagement scores and reduce turnover through the design and development of award-winning employee reward and recognition programs. We've been talking a bit about how he got himself into this and just what it means. After the break, we're going to learn more about how to design these systems and their ROI. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Dr. Elise Cortez is a management consultant specializing in meaning and purpose, an inspirational speaker and author. She helps companies visioneer for greater purpose among stakeholders and develop purpose-inspired leadership and meaning-infused cultures that elevate fulfillment, performance, and commitment within the workforce. To learn more or to invite Elise to speak to your organization, please visit her at EliseCortez.com. Let's talk about how to get your employees working on purpose. This is Working on Purpose with Dr. Elise Cortez. To reach our program today or to open a conversation with Elise, send an email to Elise, A-L-I-S-E, -E, at EliseCortez.com. Now, back to Working on Purpose. Thanks for staying with us and welcome back to Working on Purpose. I want to share something with you. Something magical happened over the last few months in the pandemic, and that, that is that I had a baby. Did you know that, Michael? I had a baby. It actually comes in the form of this thing. It's a book called Purpose Ignited. This is my baby, my pandemic baby. Um, but for listeners and, and viewers, um, it's it's called Purpose Ignited, How Inspiring Leaders Unleash Passion and Elevate Cause. And I wrote it really to turn on the, the readers to their own passion, purpose, and inspiration. And I hope it'll, it'll do that for you as well. So I love doing that. It's out. It's available on Amazon. I'd love for you to read it, and I'd love your feedback. If you're just joining us, my guest is Michael Levy. He's the CEO of WorkProud. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. So Michael, um, one of, here we are talking about employee recognition and the importance of that. But one of the things I've heard you say in some of the work we've done together and the presentations that we've co-facilitated and led is you say that there's a study out there that finds that nearly half of employees feel undervalued. So if we know this is important to people, in your experience, why do you think this percentage is so high? Why do we keep doing this? So it's not, it's, it's a challenge to know how to answer and respond to the question uh, at a scale that most organizations find themselves. Mm -hmm. It is challenging enough within a family unit or a very small company to express 
uh, to both express emotion mm -hmm. and express emotion in a construct of a commercial setting in a way that doesn't necessarily diminish uh, our own value as a leader when we're conveying that and to do it in a manner that is business-like, uh, considering that, that there's still supposed to be a delineation between the way we act and behave in a, in a, in a familial, personal setting to the way that we do it in a corporate setting. Mm. Right to that, that line or that delineation has become progressively more, um, or, uh, what should we say, sort of cloudy and talk about how cloudy it can be for all of the listeners that have had their pets poop during the webinar, their kids come out, pull out the monitor, some UPS FedEx guy <laughs> bring at the door and the barking and the craziness <laughs> and all that stuff going back and go blow the lawn go on, go on to the third port, shut up. <laughs> right, it's like that. Exactly. All that stuff's kind of happened. So, so to answer the question, it's a challenge because it's not easy. It's human beings and we're not sure always how to interact with them, let alone how do we do it at scale? And then how do we do it at scale within a commercial setting? And how do we do it in a commercial scale without diminishing ourselves and trying to keep a personal and professional demeanor? So that's why it's hard, right? And it hasn't been a priority. That's another thing, you know, things happen at a point in time when they're ready to happen. You know, whether we want to call this innovation, innovation at the wrong time doesn't work. Innovation in a manner that can't be executed uh, correctly also doesn't you know, work. Consider Maxwell Smart Days used to have talking phones and so forth, and all of us grew, growing up from that period thought that was a joke. Nobody would ever do that. Well, we sort of had a play with it, you know, the, the phone television things with people dressed up from the 60s. But this thing, well, that's perfectly normal. I mean, who remembers those first discussions of like, you're going to have the video phone conversation. And people <laughs> went like, you know, wow, man, my rotary dial thing and my like 15 foot long extension cord where we, you know, have those telephone calls. Well, that's the world that we live. Anyway, so it's contextual, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's where the struggle has been a combination of, you know, challenges associated with what you're trying to do, uh, knowledge of how to do it, and then a contextual sort of place in time moment. And one of the interesting things I think about what we're going to find post COVID after the, the party, so to speak, dust mess is all cleaned up, that we're like, wow, we changed. And and some of the change was accelerated. You know, it was probably change on its way anyway, but some of it has certainly been accelerated. Mm -hmm. And this area that we're talking about, which is creating purpose and explaining to people that they are meaningful as a, uh, as a business agenda is coming to the surface because people want that purpose and that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well. As you were speaking, one of the things that I was thinking about is, you know, I, I asked you the question to why, why do people feel so undervalued? And then I'm reminded, um, you and I, in last, last year, 2020, I did some work together where we were out interviewing CEOs, asking them about the importance of, of, of employees feeling uh, proud about their work and being associated with the company. And one of the people that, of course, we interviewed, who's also in my radio show, is Bob Chapman, who is the CEO of Barry Waymiller. Excellent human being. He's out to really evangelize truly human leadership. And one of the things that he really talks about, which just drives it home, is he talks about how 85% of the global workforce doesn't want to go to work. Um, that's a, Also, Gallup has that same stat. And he says a big reason for that is because they feel used. When they leave and they get home, they actually feel like they've been used for somebody else's purposes. So he, what he really is putting forth is the importance of teaching you know, individuals and certain leaders to be to care, to actually care for people. And certainly, one way to care for people is to express your appreciation of them. So he was a, he was a, such a beautiful contribution to to, to our to our, our conversations. And by the way, let me just say quickly for those of you who are listening. Um, we are certainly interested in, in more perspectives from CEOs and leaders about this topic of why it's important for employees to be proud and engaged. So if you're interested in having that, that conversation with us, contact me and we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. Uh, Elise at EliseCortez.com. 
So um, your perspective on that, on Bob's, on Bob's view and what you saw in his, in his interview. So what a great man, loved uh, you know, the inter interview and it's wonderful to have executive leaders who do not see that an agenda that says, let's bring meaning and value into individual employees lives is counter to shareholder and stakeholder value attainment not only you know has bob as that business leader helped the organization continue to grow i believe he said it was a 10 percent plus year over year growth rate uh, but it's an acknowledgement that actually it's not Profitability and growth, not, I mean, not for all companies, but for a lot of companies is driven by value creation, margin creation. And you're doing that through your human beings. How do we make our business, either product and or service, more valuable to people, as opposed to how do we drive down the costs so we can make this, you know, as cheap as possible? Granted, for some businesses, that's a reality. So it's not to say that businesses who are in that agenda should not be looking at ways in which to drive down costs, but uh, looking at it from the perspective that says people are one of the biggest cost factors and people need some level of uh, connectivity to the work they do in order to produce you know, the best results and outcomes. And I think you know, Bob really articulated that uh, there's a responsibility, so that's a dimension to the people that work for the business. Uh, but conversely, your people, as Jack Welch used to say, look after your people, they'll look after your customers, and that'll take care of the business. Uh, and so it's nice to hear CEOs beginning to put on their agenda the importance of the, the people experience, the employee experience, and then the corresponding business outcomes that can be realized as a result of that, as opposed to it being historically a soft component, now it's becoming a progressively harder, tangible component. It's harder to measure some of these, no doubt, partly because there are so many factors that are going into a business simultaneously to be able to separate what were the inputs to drive the corresponding outputs i.e. if we change an employee satisfaction survey, do we change the turnover rates or was the turnover rates driven by something else that was happening in the economy? Amazon moves into the marketplace and takes a whole lot of our retail staff out because they offered another $5. So what really did it make a difference or not? So in some ways, CEOs, as Bob has done, needs to sort of stand above that cloud of morass of inputs and outputs in a total given organization and just go, do I have a lot of people that work for me? And if I have a lot of people, do I believe that people need to be appreciated for their work and contributions and that if people who are appreciated for their work and contributions are more likely to wake up in the morning and go, I like working here because people appreciate and acknowledge me. Ah, the pay could be more. Who's not going to say that? <laughs> the pay could be more. Okay, fine. Can you affect the pay, CEO? No, not really. Okay. What else can you do? Um, I'll have free water or a coffee machine. Well, you know, many of the people took that sort of stuff away during the COVID anyway. But I'm like, the one thing that you can consider as a strategic agenda is creating, to your point, purpose and value and meaning so that people wake up in the day and go, I like working here. And I like working here because the work I do is good how do i know that because people tell me because they give me feedback because they appreciate me because they see me grow and develop as a person inside the organization and as i grow and develop and make great contributions other people go nice job well done you're doing better so a ceo that cannot see that and can only see the quarterly results and not thinking about how do those results actually come to be I believe is missing a great opportunity for their organization. Now, whether it's the CEO's responsibility or the COO's responsibility or the frontline manager's responsibility or HR. Now, that's an interesting, more complex question. 
in the big dynamism that is large U.S. corporations, where does this responsibility lie? Who should be taking the lead on this? Who has capacity to do it? Who has the budget? Granted, as the captain of the ship, you always have some level of responsibility. Right? But to label them and tag them and say it's the CEO, no. But it's a question that CEOs could easily ask and I think should begin to ask their leadership team of, do we think this is important? And if so, what are our steps and action? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of what I want to get to next, if we can just briefly, Michael. Um, you know, for our listeners, are like, okay, I get it. I got it. Yeah, this makes sense. Where do they even start? You mentioned the word strategy, which is so important, to have an employee recognition strategy. Where should they start? I think that it begins with an understanding and assessment of currently what do people think about it within the business. Because, because executives leadership like data. Fair enough, the ship is big. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Things are happening. So, assessment and whether that's an engagement survey, as a Gallup. Otherwise, it's pretty well guaranteed that you'll see as part of any Gallup survey that recognition or lack of recognition comes up as one of the key elements. But it's good to ask that. And some of the information could be anecdotal. Some of it can be in aggregate in a survey format to know what do the frontline think. Many executives go, hey, we do great recognition here. We've got our special pin thing. We've got our annual luncheon. We've got our 15-year service anniversary plaque. We've got it. What are you talking about? That there's no recognition here. <laughs> I have heard those statements before, yes. <laughs> I love it. I hear them. And I'm like, guys, are you seriously so out of touch with what the front line wants and needs? Now, it's not to say that what everybody does is no good, right? It's to say there are things that in every organization is part of the culture and the legacy and the history and that those things should be retained, right? But we should at least ask the questions of, well, what of those things were good, right? What are the things that people really like? Well, how many people does it touch? And please don't go ask the committee that does the birthday cakes. Hey, <laughs> committee at the birthday cakes. <laughs> You think the birthday cake program that you do is really appreciated? Really? Of course they're going to say it's this. It's their job. In fact, there are some organizations that we've come to, and they've got, like, whole department committees that fiddle around with, like, the ribbon colors for the birthday cake and the balloon thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm creating value here at this organization because I was the one that selected the ribbon color. And I'm like, okay, we've got to, again, it's not to say they know, but it's orientation, you know sort of who's driving the train, who's creating these experiences, who's assessing whether they're experienced up, and generational and contextual, and that is, how long has this program been in place with the balloon birthday bake thing? Like, oh, it's been here since like 1972, I think they did the first one. I'm like, yes, very current. I'm sure that all of your, I'm sure that, <laughs> I'm sure that all your modern employees, you know, basically anybody that's under 45 years old, like 80% of your workforce, probably don't relate to it anymore at all. But no one's actually looked at it. Hey, we're too busy. We've got this other thing. We're doing this other thing. Anyway, so to that, you know, important question, where do you go? Well, ask yourself, you know, through your organization, of course, in the form of survey anecdotal feedback, what do people think? Okay, how do we think recognition is being managed? Do we think it's being done well? And somewhere within that process, you're probably going to need to identify to yourself a champion, a cultural ambassador, a who is going to speak to the voice and experience that we'd like it to be. Now, certainly this is where the CEO does have a role. If they want to create a legacy in an organization, rest assured it won't be a quarterly result that no one can remember after they flogged off the shares. Oh, yeah, that was the CEO that we did the thing. Did he end up in here? What happened to that person? You know that. <laughs> you know, why did they go, Bob created a legacy of, of this, this cultural dimension that extended beyond, that people remembered and feel connected to the value of. Interestingly, even the CEO of BlackRock, not too long ago, I think in the last couple of years, have begun to intimate to some of his publicly traded company CEOs, hey, we want to look at your human capital in another dimension. Mm -hmm. And some of them have been talking about it more frequently. There's a lot of press associated with 
you know, um, you know, diversity and inclusion and the combination of boards, etc. And of course, you know, that's a great positive step and a trajectory that we're thank God on, which is people should be valued not by what they look like, but what they do and they contribute and who they are as people. Great. That's an excellent trend and momentum. And the faster that it gets to the point where we're all colorblind, so to speak, the better it is. However, a forced requirement to mix up your board like a chess game so that it's got the right combination of these colors and combinations only produces an external artificial influence on who you should actually make as your board. If you have to force it, great, better than not doing anything at all. But better still is to let it naturally evolve and grow and develop and reflect the world and culture that you want it to be as a mm -hmm. Michael, let's stop you there just if you, we can, because you I know you have the ability to, to really paint a picture for us. But I want to grab our last break here so we can go on to some more meat. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Cortez. We're in there with Michael Levy. He is the CEO of WorkProud, and he has helped with his team over 450 companies greatly improve their engagement scores and reduce turnover through their design and development of award-winning award winning employee reward and recognition programs. We've been talking a bit about the strategy behind and the importance of employee recognition. After the break, we're gonna get more into the need of designing them and their ROI. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Dr. Elise Cortez is a management consultant specializing in meaning and purpose, an inspirational speaker and author. She helps companies visioneer for greater purpose among stakeholders and develop purpose-inspired leadership and meaning-infused cultures that elevate fulfillment, performance, and commitment within the workforce. To learn more or to invite Elise to speak to your organization, please visit her at EliseCortez.com. Let's talk about how to get your employees working on purpose. This is Working on Purpose with Dr. Elise Cortez. To reach our program today or to open a conversation with Elise, send an email to Elise, A-L-I-S-E, -E, at EliseCortez.com. Now, back to Working on Purpose. Thanks for staying with us and welcome back to Working on Purpose. If you're just joining us, my guest is Michael Levy. He is the CEO of WorkProud. So, Michael, let's get into some more of the, of the actual meat. We've been talking strategy and high level. Now I want to, if you would, talk a little bit about what would define an effective and a successful employee recognition program. What would that look like? Uh, I'd, I'd like to look at it in a uh, reverse engineer from the perspective of the employee and considering it from the organization. Okay. So, I'm Michael Levy. I work for... ABC Incorporated. I show up to work each day on time. And on Thursday, I did this extra great thing, right? I self propelled myself to improve a skill set, go above and beyond on a customer experience, did something outside of my core job function and description to the greatest satisfaction of my teammate, customer, manager, subordinate, you name it. What should happen to me as a result of that? I should be acknowledged, possibly a little publicly, maybe within the group of people that know me or that I know them. Maybe my manager should be notified. Maybe if it was really important what I did, my manager's manager should be notified. And it begins with that construct in mind, which is, are the mechanisms by which positive actions by an employee can be seen, captured, and nurtured in a positive, constructive fashion within an organizational structure that does the following. Personal satisfaction for me, I feel good about it. If I feel good about it as the person that did the work, what am I most likely to do? Go across the road and see if they're paying me another 3% more? Or, hey, I feel good about that. I should do that kind of thing again. Two, that the organization begins to see where that activity is happening, happening a lot, not happening at all. Mm. And then beginning to ask yourself the question, 
well, that's interesting because I know that if it happens a lot in a positive way, I got KPI outcomes, you know, net promoter score outcomes, Gallup engagement survey business outcomes, retention rate, quality performance, attendance, safety, whatever the variables are that drive that particular unit. And conversely, when it doesn't happen at all, what am I seeing at the KPIs? How big is the delta between those two? How much money does the delta cost and produce so that I'm beginning to actually tie that connectivity from, or what is the program to hit? So first is to begin to get into that mindset and orientation, and then to think through, well, uh, what could we do to create experiences that are like that? What processes and procedures, what mechanisms do we have in place to do that? And then the humanistic part. So let's firstly talk about the, the mechanisms by which it can take place. So we'll give you the two illustrations, right? The first is uh, one client uh, used to have the little cards. Hey, we do recognition, it's fantastic. There are cards in managers' desks all over the organization, and they can pull out the you're a star card. And they can write and fill out the card and then they can hand it to the card to the person right? and then do it. now hey a handwritten note from a business leader right to you on a personal level that says hey i want i dear john i wanted to really thank you for the outstanding work that you did it was amazing details etc is enormously powerful right it's just that a it takes a lot of work so the, the frequency by which it's happening is out, let's say, weighed by its power to who saw it, who knew if it happened. There's no database to go, that manager does it a lot. That manager doesn't do it at all. No one knew. So that is weakness. And, you know, because there's a lot of organizations that we talk to, like, we've got this wonderful culture thing. I'm like, don't stop doing that. Nothing I'm going to say to you should replace the fact that that exists. However, what is everybody else doing, all right? And that's the classic scenario that we sort of see. So, right? Some companies come and tell us, well, you can email Francine in HR, right? When you see something amazing happening, right? So you've got like a 10,000 person organization, there's stuff happening all the time. And then, you know, leadership goes, yeah, we've got a recognition program. They can email Francine. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> then what happens? All right. What does Francine do, right? Do I get to know eventually that Francine's going to pass on that I was a rock star? You're right. That's the thing. There's nothing wrong with Francine. She's doing a fantastic job. She actually has another job in the organization. She wasn't the inbox for the recognition stuff. And then, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. Oh, no, what do you mean? They put in their spreadsheet and then they give it this committee and then the committee meets together and then the committee decides and then the committee, it's like a Dilbert. And by that time, the employees left the organization, right? Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. What, <laughs> what is the, the CEO gets up on stage. I'd like to, I'd like to recognize Frank. Frank oh, no, Frank left. Okay, what's the next one on the list? Shit, isn't there somebody on the list? <laughs> <laughs> right, but I mean, seriously, this is what happens. Right. Lost in the weeds. Correct. All right. So the timeliness of it, the systematization, the lack of visibility, the lack of visibility at the organization level, the lack of visibility within that, within you know, the inability to go, did you do it frequently? Da, da, da. Right. So on the other side, again, as I said, you know, early on in the presentation, everything has a time. Anybody seen one of these? You wouldn't believe it. It's oh, this. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. it's a fantastic thing. Thing. Your employee populations have got those. I remember when we started doing this 15, 20 years ago. People don't have phones. Okay, fine. 15, 20 years ago, we were innovative and right at the front line. Now this is a thing, right? Can't go to a shop and buy a flip phone. My God, my wife reminds me, why did you give the kids one of those phones? You can't get them off the phone. It's a, it's a separate conversation. The <laughs> evil. That's <laughs> because it's so exciting and attractive. But this is not a device, as I say, right? This is a window, and the window will show different things. When we are in our window, we are looking experientially for things. And so we say to companies, every one of your employees, when they go on break, goes like this. <laughs> they may not be on break, and they go like this. 
Right, that's right. Are they looking at things that relate to your company or are they out there on the social media and the TikTok and the Instagram and they're catching up and they're seeing who's doing, they're catching up and they're seeing who's doing. Hear that subtlety, I'll do it in slow motion. They're catching up. They're connecting with people, with their social networks and they're looking at their stars or their tennis or their sports scores and their other stuff. And we're like, hey, we can't stop that, right? I mean, you can put a policy, no phone on the manufacturing plant, yes. But as soon as they, they have an opportunity to pick it up, they're gonna look and we're like, let's create some space around the business, right? And the space around the business that we might have the potential to engage a population with is positive activities and things that are happening with their peers. Mm -hmm. Bring it back home, yes. And what did they accomplish and have they gone above and beyond? Remember I was doing the recognition in a handwritten note. Well, now let's do it in this way. Let's pull up the device. Let's call up the company app. Let's go, hey, I want to recognize Elise. She did this fantastic job. They're literally, you know, this is what we can do, talking into the phone. What a great job she just did. I just attended this meeting with her. I just saw her do this thing with this patient. I just heard her do this fantastic thing with this customer. She just did this amazing merchandise thing. Let me take a photo of it. Let me post it up. So what it's doing is saying, oh wow this great little device allows us to create the experiences that we wanted to have michael have on thursday after he did this great thing and we can probably get them to do it at a 10x to 100x factor than the multiple cards and we can see exactly who did what so we know where it's happening a lot and then correlate to apis a little bit and none at all. And we can, it, it, what I would call, uh, the word I like to use is sort of amplify the positive energy or recognition mm. through the cool things that Facebook and Instagram taught us to do, which is I read this great thing about Elise and she did this great, really cool thing with her customers or with her team or with this innovation. And I'm going to share it now with another part of the organization. Why is it really <laughs> relevant? Because you are in a business of 10,000 people. So if we have recognition activity and notifications and the manager celebrating, and then there's some birthdays and then there's some people's anniversaries and then this person got promoted. And then by the way, there's this new wellness thing, which we all do and incorporate into a unified experience. We have to organize it sort of in a micro level because you only know about a hundred people or have need to know about a hundred to 250 people around you. You don't need to know about what people in another country necessarily are doing, mm -hmm. unless what they're doing is so important that it got that shared with your group. So it is now organizing and systematizing the creation of social networks that are encouraging right, and amplifying positive things that people are doing inside the business, which is saying to other people in the business, here are good things and see how these people are being appreciated for their good things. And you know, it's colorblind. And look how interesting our rainbow happens to be. It's mm -hmm. natural. I didn't shove it in there with an artificial external HR policy campaign to try and make it happen. No. I'm letting it happen and grow and evolve in a way that speaks to a population in a language and format that is natural to them. Oh. So there's that sort of everything has a time. Um, that's so beautiful, Michael. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show because you know I'm a fan of what you do. I think it's really important. I think it's so elegant. You use technology. You allow people to, you allow organizations to scale appreciation. What a thing. And guess what? We've managed to poop away a whole hour already together, almost. So we've come to the end of the show already, Michael. So um, you know this show is listened to by people across the world who care about creating a workplace that is meaningful, where they can, they can be enriched, fulfilled, and grow. What do you want to leave the listeners with? I, I would like to listen to two things. Firstly, in the event that any of our clients and customers do happen to hear this show, which will, of course, promote it, I want to thank you all for your individual contributions. For we and my team are a reflection of the great inputs and ideas that you've had, the great inputs and collaborations that people like you, Elise, you know, we love doing that. Um, and then the only promotion is if this you think is something that is an initiative that you want to pursue and explore, inexpensive, massive ROI, want to look like a huge success inside your business, whether you be the executive leader or otherwise, 
you want to take this approach forward, go to workproud.com, workproud.com, and from there we'll pick it up and help you. Michael, what a beautiful way to finish the show. I was going to send them there as well. So I'm glad you beat me to it. Thank you so much for sharing your your passion, your wisdom, and your experience with us. It's just been wonderful to chat with you on air. Finally have you on my program. Great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. All the best to you. Absolutely. Listeners, you knew where to find them. You know, look them up. They're doing great work. Um, and last week, you missed the live show. You can always catch a re- re- recorded podcast. We were on there with Peter Comber talking about collaborative creativity in the workplace and to innovate and to increase employee fulfillment. It was actually really a smashing conversation because it was a full moon for, for both of us. 5 p.m. in Dallas for me, midnight for him in Milan, Italy. We had technology problems and we still managed to have great gobs of fun. It was a great conversation, very illuminating. I hope you'll catch it. Next week, we'll be on the air with John Baker, who is the CEO of D2L, which stands for Desire to Learn. We'll be talking about the importance and role of continual education and development in today's rapidly ever-evolving marketplace and workforce. See you there. Remember that work is at least a third of our life, so let's work on purpose. We hope you've enjoyed this week's program. Be sure to tune into Working on Purpose, featuring your host, Dr. Elise Cortez, each week on W4CY. Together, we'll create a world where business operates conscientiously, leadership inspires and passion performance, and employees are fulfilled in work that provides the meaning and purpose they crave. See you there. Let's work on purpose.